Today we are um, thrilled to welcome Craig Nippenberg. Um, Craig is going to talk about understanding your child's social brain. Craig does a lot of work uh, around town um, with teaching kids and talking to adults about the brain and how it affects how you feel, how you learn um, and act. He is a licensed uh, social worker in private practice here in Denver, working with individuals and families with a focus on children and adolescents. He's the co-founder of the Neurobehavioral Training Center of Denver and a consultant to St. Anne's, uh, where he goes in and teaches this stuff to children, um, and a board member at Denver Academy. So Craig, welcome. Thanks for Thank being you, with Sharon. us. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you very much. Yeah, this is going to be more move to yeah. Yeah. move around. Thank you, everyone. Glad to have you all here. And it's a real pleasure to be back at Stanley. Not many of the folks, I don't even think the faculty anymore know, but I helped start the counseling program back in 2001 and did consulting in the middle school about four hours a week. Uh, Tim had hired me to come over and help with their middle school. Uh, and there were a couple things I noticed here at Stanley. First of all, the level of creative thinking with the students was really superior. And if you remember 2001, that was a time when a lot of our thoughts were challenged that fall. And just hearing the kids talk about that and process that in really much more complex ways than I had seen with other students. The other piece of it was that was the year that Stanley chose to double the size of their middle school. Okay, So they brought in a whole bunch of new students. Now, in a moment, we'll be talking about the frontal lobe system and impulse control and sort of internal structure. So for you Stanley parents, what does Stanley really like to have in their students? Internal control, internal drive, internal mastery, right? Are you looking a lot at external control? Some, but the kids could call me Craig. When I first showed up, the kids are on sofas and they're calling me Craig. And I'm like, it's Mr. Nippenberg, buddy, and get in a chair. You know, it, it was a, a way out of the box for me coming from St. Anne's, but it's all in the internal part. Well, when you double the size of your middle school, bringing a bunch of new students, there were two things. One is some of those students didn't have the best internal control. And so my job was to sort of help to guide the middle school in a little more structure, a little more structure for the kids that needed it. The second piece is, and today we're primarily going to be talking about the brain and sort of your child's genetics. So if you think of a pair of dice, you roll the dice, one of your kids might have double ones, snake eyes, another of your kids might have double sixes, you're going to have a four and a three, it's sort of that genetic makeup of your child and knowing who your child is. Now, that's going to be a simplified brain version. The other thing that you have to remember is the brain develops in harmony with the environment. So the other thing those students had that came here in 6th, 7th, and 8th grade was they didn't have five, six, seven years of Stanley teaching methods, right? They weren't used to this internally driven, self-motivated structure. They came from a whole different structure. So when they came here, were they sort of fish out of water? Yes, and, and your brain develops in harmony with your environment, and you can never forget that piece of it. So it's together. A couple quick house cl uh, cleaning things. On February 8th, I'll be speaking along with DJ McClary, who was just here, he's the IT guy here at Stanley, and Susan Klein from uh, Jewish uh, Day School. Is it, is it the Denver, what's this? it's got a new name, is that right? <clears throat> we'll be speaking over at Grayland uh, as part of the circle of influence where the, the counselors groups from the independent schools, we've reformulated the old circle of concern group. Some of you may have heard of it. It was a parent run group for years out of Kent, was in all the high schools and it closed about a year, year ago. The founding mothers just couldn't do it anymore. And uh, so we sort of wanted to revamp it. So this is our first and what we hope will be many speaking engagements in the future. And this one is on the impact of technology on family intimacy. So it, it's not necessarily how do you monitor your kid's Facebook because my kid does my Facebook for me. Uh, I can't monitor anything he does because I have no clue. But really how it's impacting us in positive and negative ways. So being the older curmudgeon type, I'll probably be talking more about the negatives. DJ's a young guy with two young kids. He's an IT guy. So his view on, on it is, this is great. Right? And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, those whippersnappers with their technology. Right? So you're welcome to come to that on February 8th. I always like to pull things out of the news when I go to speak from that day. Um, as was mentioned, I'm doing this. This, is, this talk is based on about 15 years work at St. Anne's where I teach kindergarten through eighth grade. I have kindergartners this morning at uh, 10.30, I'll be over there. 
and a curriculum, brain-based curriculum that I've put together over the years, and hopefully one of these days, if I have the time, we'll publish it. Uh, but out of the news recently, uh, Time, did anybody see the new Time this week? It was on the power of shyness, okay? Now, basically, the article's on sort of the typology of introvert versus extrovert, and we can talk about that a little later just in terms of how that happens in your brain. So, as we look at the mix of these three main brain regions, you can, we'll, we'll analyze how you would create an extreme extrovert, how you would create an extreme introvert based on those three things. Uh, the other piece, tragically, some of you heard about the 17-year-old girl that jumped out of her car on 285. She was in the back, her mother was driving. They were, she was upset, apparently they were having a fight. She jumped out of the car while the car was moving and she was hit and killed. Uh, another teenager, actually like one in the morning, a teenager uh, who was driving his car wasn't doing anything illegal uh, and their four friends hit her and she died and traumatized a whole lot of folks and she's no longer with us. What's interesting in the article is uh, one of her best friends talks about two things. One is her and her mom had a great relationship, okay? So when you hear about something like this, what's your first thought? Oh, they must have just hated each other and they were fighting all the time. And apparently they had a great relationship. The second thing she said was, she was pretty emotional, right? Can teenagers get pretty emotional? Yes, yes. I will, yeah. I sort of, the fan is cranked up. Oh, and it's a little warm up here, I don't know. So I will try to speak up over the fan. No, and if you can't hear me in the back, Raise your hand or something. Okay, Phil? Can you turn your mic Actually, this is just for the camera. I see. This isn't for, there's no sound system in here. It's just for the recording. Now, the third, cartoon, the third piece is a cartoon, and this, this is for the parents out here, as your kids struggle with social issues. So, all kids are going to have social successes. All kids are going to have social difficulties. Can it really pull at your heart? Yes. How many of you had, have had your heart just wrapped around your kids' social issues? It's pretty easy. I'll tell you about some that I had over the years. And this, this one, <clears throat> the mom is driving her little girl to school. And mom says, did you see Brianna at school today? And the little girl, sa and, uh, the little girl says, yeah, and we're friends again. Best friends again. Now, the two days before this was all about how Brianna told her she wasn't her friend. What? Said her mother. Yesterday, she said Megan was her best friend. And the little girl says, yeah, and Megan cried when Bri Brianna blew her off. The mom said, well, now I feel bad for Megan. <clears throat> and the little girl says, if you can't stand the heat, stay off the playground, mom, <laughs> right? So do the kids themselves know that it's a lot of turmoil, right? And it's shifting up and down day after day. And there are some stages that are a little bit more intense than others. Now, today we're gonna look at, okay, what what's the brain that makes us? And as a beginning point, one of the great things <clears throat> is that we know that, that survival, our species, depends, is largely dependent on those who can live in community, those who can trust others, those who can work together, right? I was talking with one of the parents before about companies are looking for people who have good social skills so that we can trust, we can work, those who have empathy. Our survival as a species depends on us living as a group. Fortunately for us, our brains are wired to do that. So we are wired to live as a community. What I like to do with kids in teaching them about their brains is two things. One, first of all, help every child understand how their brain works and that you can have some control over it. So the more you think about paying attention, if you get a child to think about paying attention, guess what happens to their attention? It goes up, right? The more you think about it, the better it works so they can understand themselves. The second point, and I really feel very strongly about this one at St. Anne's, is when you understand these things and you look at your peers around you, it is your moral imperative to help the kid who's struggling. Might be the kid struggling sitting still and paying attention, right? Might be the kid that doesn't read the social cues very well, is sort of awkward socially. Might be the kid that gets a little nervous trying something new, the kid that gets a little mad on the playground. Your idea is not to, what, what their imperative is, not to put these kids down, not to make fun of them, but to do what? To help them, right? And, and I really try to demystify it all to help kids understand their brain in a very simple way. 
I also find as a parent myself in my job and as a parent that it really helps my patients. So when I can look at my 18 year old son <laughs> and go, this shall pass, <laughs> it really helps me be patient. And there are times when I've wanted to respond and it wouldn't have been pretty. Um, and I've reminded myself, this is what's going on in his frontal lobe. <laughs> now, just a quick story, I didn't even thought of this one in the lecture, but in fifth, my son was in fifth grade and uh, every morning I would take him to school. I was a single parent for years. I'd be reading my paper, drinking the coffee and he was in his room and I said, honey, don't forget your chores. And out of the back room I heard, don't tell me what to do. And I was like, bristling, right? Now, unfortunately, I bid on it. And I started in on, wait a minute, I give the orders here, you follow, right? He's in fifth grade and I had already used my dad's speech, which was there's one general in this house, there's one private. And the general tells the private what to do, right? It was ugly. We get in the car, we're driving to St. Anne's, and I just, it, it dawned on me, he had his first mood swing ever. He had his first emotional mood swing. And I horribly overreacted. So I, as we're driving, I said, honey, I'm so sorry. I overreacted. I know things just changed for you with your mood and I shouldn't have reacted myself. I should have stayed calm. So it was cool, I dropped him off. That afternoon he comes home, letter from the fifth grade teachers about the preteens' hormones <laughs> and how parents need to stay calm. <laughs> now, I'm the school consultant, right? And I'm like, oh my God, I failed. Both professionally and personally on the first trial, I failed miserably. So, as you understand it, it gives me patience, both in my work and at home. And the other day, I said to my wife, because he had done something that was sort of mature, and I said, it's a spontaneous moment of maturity. It happens sometimes. And, and she said, now, that's a crumb. He gave me a crumb. A couple more and I'll make a crumb cake. Um, and, and we're seeing glimpses of that transitioning. So again, it, it really helps you be patient. Now, we're gonna do three brain systems. This first one, we might even do a little acting. If I can get maybe some willing volunteers in the front row. Um, and we're gonna talk about your frontal lobe functioning, the president, okay? And I'm gonna tell you the story. Some of you have heard it. And we'll just act it out real quick. The story of Phineas Gage, who was a railroad worker in the 1870s in Vermont. So, may I have four of you just stand, would you mind? Just stand up, come on up. It's, you don't have to say anything. You're just gonna kinda stand in a line and mimic some. Come on up, okay. Now who wants to be Phineas? <laughs> Okay, you're Phineas. All right, now, so we're thinking about railroad workers in the 1870s. What do you think, they, they would be males, of course. What do you think they, what kind of, how would you describe male railroad workers, your stereotype? How would you describe them, probably? Educated? No, no probably not. You know, fourth grade, maybe. Uh, Well-mannered? No. Uh, you know, working, sweating all day, very clean. Probably not. Uh, if they hit their thumb with a hammer or whatever, what's coming out of their mouth? Lots of the F words and it's not fine. It, it's the other F word. Um, after work, what do you think they're doing? Drinking. Drinking, playing cards, maybe a little fist fighting, getting upset, right? What you did I hear? Beating their wives. Beating their wives. <laughs> <laughs> I knew I was at Stanley. <laughs> now, can I tell something else funny? The great, I love coming to Stanley. I've done this talk <coughs> twice here over the years. My two favorite places to talk about teen sexuality are Stanley and Montessori Evergreen. Because the parents get so into it and they throw out all these perspectives and you're like, whoa, this is great, right? I was doing a talk for a Lutheran men's group up in the mountains this weekend and they were just mortified by the concept. You know, I'm like, come on guys, loosen up, it's okay. But Stanley parents, I can always count on that extra perspective on things, it's the best. All right, so that's our average worker. Now, they had four tasks on their crew. Our first worker is gonna drill a hole, okay? So they're, they're blasting, they gotta blast away rocks. So you're just gonna go boo, 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 boo. Excellent. <laughs> Next worker comes along, is gonna pour the gunpowder in, okay? So just pretend you're pouring the gunpowder in the hole, okay? Now, if you lit it right now, which way is the energy going up? Straight up. Straight up. Just gonna blow it straight up out of the hole. So what they have to do? To make the energy go down, you have to cap it somehow. Third worker, port sanded. Sanded. 
sand. Okay. Now, if you, if you lit it right now, what's going to happen? You're going to have a sandstorm. It's not hard enough. So you have to find some way to pack the sand harder than the rock below it. And that involved Phineas. And Phineas had a big long pole. I'll show you a picture of it. Three, four feet long, steel pole. And would stick it in the hole. No, no, you got a hammer, sledgehammer. Put it in the hole with your left hand. And then the sledgehammer. Are you left or righty? I just stuck the pole. He was right handed. So, yeah. So Phineas sticks the pole in the hole and hits it. Okay? Now, which job is the most dangerous? Phineas. Think about it. You're putting a steel pole on top of gunpowder. Okay? So, the owner of the railroad company was very wise in his choice in picking Phineas to be this person and also the foreman of the crew. So Ph Phineas was the foreman. And when you read the medical description of him in the journals, it said Phineas was well-mannered, he was punctual, he was organized, he had good attention skills, he could manage time, he was not of drink, he was not of gambling, and he didn't use what nowadays we say is inappropriate language. Okay? I love yeah. that term. That's like the last 20 years we've had inappropriate language. Before that, it was just cursing, swear words, right? And now it's inappropriate language. He was a very well-mannered guy. Okay? So we start. One day they're out, drill the hole, gunpowder goes in, and our sand person maybe is a little hungover from last night and <laughs> walks, <laughs> walks past the hole. Phineas doesn't know that, sticks the pole in. Now give Sorry. it a big swing with a sledgehammer. <laughs> that pole blows up, Phineas. shuts off the diamond, shoots off, pops straight out of the hole, hits Phineas, if I don't mind, oh, about God. right here in the cheek, pops out right here. Oh. Now, Phineas is laying down. You don't have to lay down. These, <laughs> <laughs> this is Stanley, I love it. Oh, can we get some props up here? Um, the three of them go, whoa. Wow. <laughs> now, they think Phineas is dead. They come over to Phineas, and Phineas is alive and looking at them. And they say, whoa. Wow. Now, at this point, they've got to sterilize it. What would sterilize it? Alcohol. 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 Can't imagine that. They sterilize it, wrap bandages around it, put Phineas in a buckboard, take him to the closest town. I think it was about 30 miles away. Take him to a boarding house, put him in bed. Okay? They go back to work. Phineas heals. Three months later, Phineas gets out of bed and goes to work. Wow. Man. Now, Phineas, yeah, that's a headache. Phineas is fine physically, but they notice that Phineas starts acting differently. He's late. He is forgetful, doesn't have his tools. He's not organized. He gets upset easily. He starts fighting with the other workers. Um, can't manage time, leaves his tools behind, is totally out of control at night after work. What's he do? Drinks, Drinks gambles. He is a complete caveman, a complete and utter caveman. And it was the first time that doctors started going, huh, and scientists, that there must, something has to do up here that governs our behavior. Now naturally, they wanted Phineas's brain, okay? What was the only way to study a brain back then? After he died, right? Now, Phineas, while not having very good self-control, was still very bright. Phineas went to Harvard, and he said to their medical team, would you like my brain when I die? And Harvard said, now your doctor's at Harvard. Yeah. <laughs> of course. And Phineas said, give me some money now. They gave him some money. What did Phineas do with it? Gamble it, drank it all the way. Then he thought, Hmm. And he went to the doctors at Yale and said, would you like my brain? And they said, yes. yes. Gave him money. What did he do with it? Gambled it, drank it away. Then he went to Princeton and said, would you like my brain? Of course. They gave him the money. This time, in his impulsiveness, he drank himself to death and he died, a result of alcohol poisoning. Harvard got his brain. And every year they have, a, they did, they, well, they still celebrate Phineas Gage Day. Apparently up until about 30 years ago, they actually went to the site in Vermont with his skull 
until one year, like I think it was 1980 or something, a medical student dropped it. And uh, they, they had to rebuild it, so they don't take it out of the medical school anymore. I guess it stays there. But let's give a round of our applause to our <laughs> actors. And I'll show you a quick picture. This is Phineas's skull and the tamping iron that shot through it. Maybe I'll come back here. And, and it's just an amazing sight when you see the size. That's the actual rod and his skull that shot through it. And it went all the way through. It, all the way through. So it literally blew his brains out and he survived. At least it blew out his frontal lobe. That's the actual skull and tamping iron, okay? All right, that was you, yeah. You were fabulous, excellent. Now, so again, then scientists started thinking about what does this thing do for us, right? It helps you pay attention. Now attention has several functions. First one is, teacher says, okay kids, get out your math books, all right? Maybe we're doing um, free time reading. What do I have to do in that moment? I have to put away my reading book, right? Then what do I have to do? Retrieve my math book, right? Teacher, a teacher says, turn to page 10, no, turn to page 12, do problems 14 through 16, okay? Now, in that sequence, as I'm getting the math book out, what do I have to remember? 12, 14 to 16, that's called your working memory you don't need that very long. Will that child need to remember that for the rest of his life or her life? No, right? It's just a short time. Easiest way to think about it, if you read the newspaper in the morning, you're on page one, it says story continued on 6B or 6A, okay? As you're turning and taking a sip of coffee, what do you need to remember? 6A, how many of you have forgotten and had to go back to the start? It gets worse as you get older, it, it definitely. There's times now I, I don't even remember what I was reading and I have to go back to see what the article was so I can find the story. So the child gets out the book. What page do they turn to? 12, what problems? 14 to 16, okay. Now, that frontal lobe's gotta get focused on that material, come on in. It's gotta get focused on that material. Pay attention for problem 12, pay attention for problem 13, pay attention for problem 14. Okay, so it's sort of this alert to the instructions coming in, stop what you're doing, alert to that new instruction, get out your supplies, use your working memory, hopefully you're organized. How many of your kids, do, do they have regular desks in the lower school here? Or is it all community tables? Yeah. It's community tables. Um, <laughs> if you had desks, say in the end we have desks, you know, everybody in their desk. Now if I went to the fourth grade right now, looked in the desks, are some of them going to be perfectly organized? Yes. yes. Usually which gender? The girls, okay? And they've got little flowers and stuff. <laughs> some of the boys, what's it going to look like? Oh, no. Disaster, okay? So it helps if you're organized. Helps if you have pencils in your little drawer and your pencils are sharpened and you haven't chewed off the eraser, right? Some kids do the chewing thing. So then you're focused on that. When it's time to end math, what's your frontal lobe need to do? Get off of it, okay? So it helps you pay attention, stay on task, and then switch your attention to something else and involves that working memory and the organization piece, okay? There are some people who hyper-focus. Have you ever heard of that? It's when you're, and we're gonna talk about technology, video games a little later, it's when you can't get off of it, right? You're so engrossed in it, you can't get off it. Now, can that engrossment lead to beautiful music, beautiful poetry, Beautiful books, yes. Beautiful art, okay? Is it so functional in a classroom sometimes? Maybe not, it gets a little bit tough, right? Or if it's a video game that you're over-focused on, right? How many of you have struggled getting your kids off video games or TV? How many of your kids, when you say, time for dinner, immediately shut it off and come running in? <laughs> uh, probably not, right? They're just so hyper-focused on that thing. So we've got the attention, the organization, there's also movement control. The movement control center in your frontal lobe is right about the middle. It's a little strip right here, okay? Do we have any fidgeters in the room? Anybody fidget? Okay. Any, any of you when you were kids were more hyper? Did we have any tiggers in the room? Were any of you tiggers? You know, like, shh, okay? No spinners or anything? Some of you, come on, you guys. 
Mark T, I know, you were probably one of those kids. Um, but that's the movement control center. Do some kids need to fidget? Yeah. Yes, they need a little stress ball. I love pens. I always have a pen with me. I'm constantly moving my pen. My father was even more of a fidgeter. He literally could not sit still. Uh, he always had to shake his foot, which he did in a pro socially appropriate manner. If me business meetings went too long, he would excuse himself, go out in the hallway and just pace, okay? Until he died at 85, he was always moving. He could not sit still. Um, also, time management. Now, in time management, we're not talking about reading a clock. We're talking about an internal perception of time. I do a thing with fourth graders at St. Anne's where I, I show a, a couple pages in a book. And I say, okay, first thing I want you to do, we're all going to get out your books and read these two pages. I want you to estimate how long it will take you to read that and write it down. So we do that, and then we time them. I time them, and we see how close they got. We do 10 math problems. They have to estimate how long it will take them. I ask them to estimate how long it will take them to run a lap around the field and come back. Then their homework assignment is every night for a month to write down how long they think their homework will take them and write down how long it took them. Okay? Why is that important academically? Planning. Planning. Mom, can I watch SpongeBob? I love SpongeBob. Not many of your kids watch anymore, probably. Well, do you have much homework? Oh, 20 minutes. Okay. Watch a SpongeBob. Now it's 9 o'clock. Okay, time for bed, honey. It was, you start your homework at 8.30. I'm only a quarter of the way through, right? They didn't estimate the time. For some kids, you say, honey, you all carpool, right? We don't have, you don't have a bus, do you? Yeah, we all, I did the carpool thing all those years. You say to your kid, we're leaving in five minutes. We gotta go, five minutes. Some of your kids, the, the pre-accident Phineas, are like, okay, mom, they zip upstairs, they get on their socks, their shoes, and they come running down ready to go. Other kids, Start upstairs. Oh, a Lego. I haven't seen this Lego in like two years. And the next thing you know, they're playing. Or the dog comes up, and then we're playing with the dog. Time to go. They come running down, they got one sock on, no shoes, right? They're not managing time. Now, where that gets really critical, and this is where it gets more serious as you look at your own kid, and we'll talk about where all kids are on that spectrum, we're playing kickball here at Stanley. Somebody kicks the ball out across Quebec, okay? At St. Anne's, the kids know there's a rule. If it goes over the fence, what do you do? Get a teacher. You do not go over the fence. But let's say some of the kids are over there playing, or they're at home. You, you wouldn't let this happen, Tim. I can't say it. So your kids are at home. They kick the ball across Quebec. What, what's all the kids, what do most of the kids want to do? Get the ball back, right? Now, hopefully they do what first? Stop and look both ways. There are some kids, the pre-Phineas, the post-Phineas, what would he have done? Run. Run right across, right? Let's say your kid stops. Now, he looks both ways, sees a car coming. What does his brain have to calculate mathematically? How long before car A reaches point B, how long before boy C can get past point B, okay? Now, if you can do that accurately, are you safe? Yes. If you're off by 50%, could you get hit? Yes. Kids who are on this end of the spectrum, this is the post-accident Phineas, on this end, when they do the research on those kids, they're off by as much as 50% in estimating time. Okay? Do these kids have a lot more accidents than other kids? Yes. Statistically, kids on this end of the spectrum have 400 times the accidental death rate of other kids. They don't manage time, they run across the street, they're impulsive, they don't control those things. Maybe they don't control their emotions, right? So your frontal lobe also controls your emotions. The pre-accident Phineas, did he get upset and fight? No, post-accident Phineas, quick to respond. As I learned this morning, he didn't shut his, what's it, what's it? who's telling me about the shut the trap or sh shut the door? That's the thing they're using here at, at Stanley for kids. This comes out of curriculum, I guess, where you stop your emotions by shutting the door on your emotions yeah, and you use your thinking. Lid. Don't flip your lid, they call it, okay? <laughs> Phineas accident, after the accident, is flipping his lid. His emotions are just coming out of him, okay? Um, when you have teenagers, as I do, what's the most difficult driving move, uh, move for a teenager to learn? Left turns. Mm -hmm. To make a left turn, what do you have to calculate? How fast are those cars coming? 
Now, if you're a split second off, what do you hear? The horn, right? Somebody's honking at you. If you're more than a split second off, you get T-bone. Okay, that's the most dangerous thing that requires good time management skills. I mentioned on your handout, there's a few more things here that aren't on the PowerPoint. The working memory, uh, gating. Gating is the ability to filter out distractions around you and focus on the conversation that you're having. Focus on the person in front of you. We just heard a little noise out here. If you've got good frontal lobe functioning, you just screen that out. You stay focused on me, okay? If you go to a cocktail party or something, are there a lot of conversations going on? Right? So part of frontal lobe functioning is to be able to filter out all those other distractions, focus on the person. Now for some reason, I don't know what the rule is here at Stanley, but at St. Anne's they've not instituted it. I've always wanted them to have a rule that says the maintenance guys may not mow the lawn during the school day, nor use the leaf blower, right? Or the uh, snow blower. Because when they go past the window, what happens to some of the kids? right? It just sucks their frontal lobes out of them as they're looking at the leaf blower. And I am too. And they're like, whoa, I wonder how many horsepower it is. Um, so it's, it's that ability to gate things out, to keep things out and, and focus on what you're doing or the person you have a conversation with. Any questions about that? And then we're going to talk about development, boys and girls, etc. Yes. Is there a test that yes, there are numerous tests. Remind me, I'll tell you about those when we get there. Yes. Um, if you've got a kid who totally has trouble with three of those things, but not impulse yes. control, it's still the same thing, or is that pointing to It's towards? what's called executive functioning. When you read a testing report now, and the teachers are calling it, uh, and psychologist, executive functioning, hence the name the president. I tell the kids at St. Anne's, use your president. Now, a little kindergartner once went home years ago and said to his mom, I have Bill Clinton in my head. <laughs> and I was like, no, you don't. <laughs> That's wrong, wrong. Oh, okay, we gotta think of a new one. Uh, but it's called using your president. Use your president. I'm constantly talking about to kids about, did you use your president? Now your teenagers, they're gonna drop on that scale. I'll tell you about that in a second. And teenagers will often say, when you say, why'd you do it? They say what? Oh, I don't know. It was an accident. And then I say, no, it wasn't. It was a failure of you to use your president to calculate the consequences of your behavior. Okay, because that's what it does. It's supposed to think about if I do this, what's going to happen? It puts together cause and effect. It is the highest seat of our brain. It's the last to develop. Cavemen didn't have much of a front, frontal lobe. So evolutionary speaking, this is the last major part of our brains. Humans have the biggest, okay? That's what really separates us from other species. Do other species have intelligence? Yes. We have the highest amount of frontal lobe planning, the ability to plan, work thoughtfully, stay focused, all these things that the Phineas before the accident could do, humans have the greatest ability for that. Um, now, it's also the last to develop during childhood. So do two-year-olds have much of a frontal lobe? No, they don't have a lot of executive functioning. Uh, they've got a lot of emotion, right? Now, when the kid doesn't get the cookie at the Safeway, what happens? Breaking down in tears, crying. Right? You are their frontal lobe at that point. Okay? They're not able to manage that. For girls, so they're sort of off the spectrum here early on. Girls are going to start about two years ahead of boys. So your three-year-old girl is going to start, her little frontal lobe is going to start growing, and she's going to move up this scale. Okay? If you go to any kindergarten classroom, what are most of the girls doing? Paying attention. How do they look? Pretty. I saw some of them come in today. I've never seen so many colors and scarves flowing on the little girls. They look fabulous. After lunch, they still look fabulous, and their hair looks nice. And when the teacher says, crisscross applesauce, spoons in the bowl, they do it, and they stay that way for quite some time. When they want to answer a question, what do they do? They raise their hand, right? What are most kindergarten boys doing? <laughs> Spitting around. Where do they like to sit? in the back, right? They try to get back there or by the, the shelves of the Legos, right? Uh, how do they look? Hair is sticking out, they got lunch on their face or ketchup on their shirt, right? When they are paying attention and answer, what do they do? Blurt it out, right? They just shot it out. They don't have as much frontal lobe functioning yet. Now, do some of the kindergarten boys have that? Yes, but it's still developing. For all the kids, the younger kids, I always say to them, they, they sit on a, a carpet for me for uh, kindergarten, first grade, and I say, now, any of you, look around at who you're sitting by. 
do you think you're going to be tempted to talk to that kid next to you during my half hour? If you are, you should probably do what? Move, right? And uh, every night I had one just yesterday. She got up and moved. And I was like, thank you, dear. You just helped the whole class earn a bug. And they have this bug system where it's like a little point and the kids get to cash it in at the end of the week. So everybody get a bug because this girl made a good choice of moving, okay? The boys, I usually have to say, um, excuse me, T, would you, would you please move? This is Mark T, by the way. He's from Denver Academy. He, he also lectures on the brain uh, and does a fabulous job. Thank you for coming. Um, so th there's a difference for the boys and girls. Now, by about third grade, you're hoping that the kids are on this scale. Where would you guess the average female is on this scale? So if we did the tests, and I'll talk about those in a minute, they're about 80th percentile. Where's the average male? 40. About 50. <laughs> You've got one of those distractible ones. <laughs> average male is about 50th percentile. So that's during this third, fourth grade period, latency, also as adults, okay? So think about it, when women watch Parenthood, Women turn on Parenthood, you know that show? Love it. <laughs> they watch the whole show. What's the average guy do? If he's gonna watch it. If he's got the remote, what's he gonna do? <laughs> ESPN, right? And back to Parenthood, back to ESPN, back to the baseball game, back over, watch the football game, back and forth. If I gave both a test on how much they got out of the show, who's gonna score better? The women are gonna know more accurately what happened because they had greater attention to the program. Guys are about the 50th percentile. Now, from a species survival standpoint, so we talked about evolutionary earlier, why would it make sense to have half our population have less executive functioning, to be more impulsive and distractible? Why would it make sense? Hunting, Hunting and protection. So let's say we're all Native Americans, we're living up in the mountains, I'm the uh, storyteller, we're all sitting around a fire, I'm telling the story, and all of you have perfect focused attention. What's gonna happen to Tim back there? <laughs> Some mountain lion's gonna sneak up, grab him off. And afterwards, we're gonna be like, where's Tim? He was just here a minute ago, right? Now, if some of us are distractible, and we hear noise, and we look, and we see a movement, we grab our spear and we throw it, could we be the hero? Yeah. Yes, unless it was Tim going to pee, <laughs> And I'm his buddy Bob, and I just speared Tim. Then it's not so good for me, right? I was too impulsive, okay? So from a strictly survival standpoint, this is a really brilliant system. Now, do you have many tigers roaming the campus here at Stanley? No. Uh, Montessori Evergreen, they would say, well, we could have one. And Colorado Spring School, I was down there speaking, and I was there one day when they actually had a bear alert and all the children on the playground run together and huddle up and they blow whistles and ring bells as the bear goes trotting by through their playground. And you're like, whoa, we've got survival instincts right here on the playground. But there's not many tigers. You really need frontal lobe functioning. You need executive functioning to be a student in most of our schools today, okay? There are some schools a little more adaptable, this being one of them, executive functioning really helps, okay? Now, We've all gotten on this system. The easiest way to think of it here, you know the Charlie Brown Christmas tree, the little scraggly tree? That's sort of the frontal lobe of the third grader. Can they do book reports now? Yes, okay, they can do a little longer time assignments. Can they sit longer than they used to? Yes, right? They can start putting several concepts together and work towards a project due at the end of the week. Okay, you're hoping to have a basic frontal lobe. Now, some of your kids might have a little better of one. So when the teacher says, the only homework this week, kids, is your book report due on Friday. Now, some of the kids, some of your kids are gonna come home on Monday and what are they gonna say? I need to go to the library. Let's go pick some books. Or we'll web it search or Google some books. They get their books, what do they do next? They plan out. Well, I'm gonna read you know, a couple chapters tonight. Tuesday, I'll finish the book and do my outline. Wednesday, I'll do my rough draft. And Thursday, I'll add my pictures and get the final touches on my project, okay? And then when that student will probably turn in on time and being the deep, thoughtful student they are when the teacher says, how would you evaluate your book report? They might even say what? It's pretty good, but I could have done a little better, okay? Other of your kids, when they come home on Monday and you say, do you have any homework, mom? What do they say? 
no, not till Thursday. And you're like, oh, wow, are you sure? Oh, yeah, teacher said it's not. We just have something on Friday. No homework. 8 o'clock Thursday night, what are they doing? i got to go to the library. I forgot to get the book. Would you take me? And you're like, well, no, I, I'm putting your little brother to bed, and, and then I've got to get ready for tomorrow. You're not helping me with my homework. You promised you would, right? It's all your fault now, right? They're up till midnight, 1 in the morning, trying to get that book together, book report together, okay? Now, not to be stereotypical, but which student gender-wise is more likely to gonna be the Monday child? The girls, and the boys are usually gonna be the ones Thursday. And that student might, when they turn it in, the teacher says, how would you evaluate yourself? They might say, great, it was fabulous, okay? Not really grasping the whole concept of internal motivated internal le learning. So you've got your basic Christmas tree, your little Charlie Brown tree. In adolescence, this thing is gonna double in size. Now they're not, their brains aren't gonna go like this, okay? But it branches, it's gonna have twice as many brain cells. They're gonna branch out so they have a nursery tree. You know, the garden, the kind you get at the nursery at the King Supers lot, the really full tree. That's gonna be their frontal lobe. For girls, it's about age 26 when it's finished growing. For males, guess what? It's about 28, okay? Now, have car companies known for a long time that you don't rent cars to 18-year-old guys? Yeah, you have to be 21, because what's an 18-year-old gonna do with a Corvette? He's gonna race it, or try to take it off-road, okay? Always pushing the limits. But it's about 26 and 28 before that thing, excuse me, is completely growing. The other piece to this that's really important is what's called dopamine. Dopamine is one of the four major chemicals in our brains. There's over 300 different chemicals in our brain that it produces. We're gonna talk about the emotional system in a little bit. We have over 300 different chemicals. There's four major ones. Dopamine's one of them. The way the brain works, we're gonna just pretend with my little actors that we're uh, our child's brain. You're gonna be the math center, okay? I'm gonna be the president. Over here, I need to, can I borrow a pen? Do you want to have a pen? Okay, and let's say I have two in each hand. Uh, you're the lunch center in my brain. You're thinking about lunch, okay? And over here, you're supposed to be thinking about math, and it's math class. And you're working on math, and all of a sudden you go, I've got cold meatloaf today. That's my favorite. Go ahead. I've got cold meatloaf today. <laughs> you're looking at me like, that's disgusting. Um, <laughs> now, at that point, my frontal lobe is gonna send out a little message, and it's gonna say to the math center, pay attention to math. The way it does it, our brain cells aren't connected. There's a little synapse between, put out your fingers for me, would you? The dendrites, there's a little synapse there. And when the electrical stimulus from this brain cell gets to here, it's gonna jump on a, a chemical of dopamine. The dopamine's gonna travel across the little synapse and it's supposed to dock with hers. When it docks, it sets it off an electrical charge, tells this one to connect to here, does the same thing, sends, you can just pass the dopamine along and say pay attention to math. And then this one, I'm gonna send out to the food center, and what's it gonna say? Think about meatloaf at lunch, okay? Think about meatloaf at lunch. <laughs> she said, think about a salad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like that's gonna happen. My wife's been trying to get me to eat salads for years. Um, okay, so now hopefully if we've got a good system, what happens to the food center? It quiets down, there's not as much electrical activity. What happens to the math center? It's fired up and we complete those math things, we've done a good job, we're successful frontal lobe, okay? During adolescence, it would be like if we had the people from this row behind us all of a sudden stand in the middle here, okay? They're not, the brain's not wired up yet. It's got all these extra brain cells and they sort of interfere with the efficient functioning of this little system that I had. It's gonna take years for them to get into place. The other thing that happens is the dopamine levels for teenagers drop in half. Okay, so if I had had two dopamines this way, two this way, is there a good chance that I'll, I'll attain my goal of paying attention? Yes. Now if I have less dopamine and there's interference, what's probably gonna happen? I'm daydreaming about meatloaf, okay? Or daydreaming about some girl in a class, okay? We're not gonna be as efficient. And so teenagers then, when you look at the newspaper, every Sunday and Monday, there's stories about teenagers doing what? having accidents, right? Uh, Rappo High School, freshman boy, 14 years old, couple years back, my son's a senior at Rappo now. Young man, this is probably five years ago. Uh, 
boy, the, he was invited by the older kids to go out for pizza after football practice. They opened the back door, he looked in, all the seat belts are taken. What should he have done right then? Said, no, I'll take another car, right? Or I'll go with somebody else, have my parents drive. He got in. Arapahoe High School has got to be the worst location for getting out of. You have to take a left turn to get out of that place. It's either on Dry Creek or University, both major streets. This place used to be horrible before the new entrance, which I love the new entrance. Do you remember how it used to be? You'd have to go out over there. The car turned, I think it was on the Dry Creek. The driver lost control, flipped in a ditch. That 14-year-old boy was killed instantly, okay? Was he using his frontal lobe? No, it, it was turned off. Whose pen do I, thank you. And this one was mine, I think. Yeah. Thank you. Let's give him another round of applause. There we go. So you're gonna see that over the teen years, this is gonna drop down. And then as they mature, it starts to move up. There are a few jumps in there. I typically find around the end of eighth grade, girls seem a little more mature, okay? They've, they've seemed to moving on to the next level. Now, socially, Michael Thompson, who wrote Best Friends, Worst Enemies, said, by eighth gr grade, the girls call a truce because they're out of ammunition. They've said every mean thing they can think of, <laughs> and there's nothing left to say anymore, so you just call a truce because you run out of ammo, okay? Uh, for the boys, it's around the end of sophomore year. So freshmen, early sophomore boys still act a lot like junior high boys. Now, how would you describe the average junior high boy? Are they really attractive creatures? <laughs> no, they really, they're like ping pong balls all over the place, okay? Now, get, God bless people like Tim and the middle school faculty here. Good middle school teachers love that energy, right? And they just think it's fabulous. The rest of us are like, Ugh, that's repulsive, right? Why are they doing all these things, okay? But around the end of sophomore year, the boys will start to mature some. It also helps if they're in a relationship because then what do they start doing? Take care. Combing their hair, showering, deodorant, uh, and, and ax. Now, unfortunately, <laughs> when they start with the ax, it's usually like 20 sprays, you know? And you're like, oh my God, I can't breathe, right? And the girls with the makeup, what do they do? It's like whoosh, all over, and you're like, I think it's supposed to be subtle, right? <laughs> so as to look like you're not wearing makeup at all, right? That's what you're trying to achieve, but that's hard for the middle schooler. So they do have some phases. Again, it's 26, 28. Frontal lobe is going to speed up until you're about 35. So there's a process called myelination. It's a, a, a sheeting over the axioms. That, that keeps that, that electrical impulse inside that axiom, so it gets, their brain gets faster and faster, until you're about 35. After 35, guess what? <laughs> oh, after 45, it really starts to go, and you can't remember anybody's name and what you were reading, and it's like, ugh. Uh, hopefully not that bad. But now we have the low T commercials, and you can get a shot of T. We're gonna talk about testosterone in a minute. Yes? Can I ask you a question now? Yeah. Isn't yes. Stuff. Yeah. And in the teen years, um, so as, so when you're parenting to children, you, yeah. you need them to have experiences to learn. Yes, from mistakes. you do. Yeah. But in the teen years, the consequences of making mistakes can be deadly. Like changing. Yes. Where is how do you oh. address the fact that they need experiences literally for yes. their brain to grow and their frontal yes. cortex to develop? Yeah. But you're talking about kind of we're we're going to talk about that at the end, but man, if I could invent a meter that would say, oh, you should, this is your kid's makeup, you should let them do that, or you shouldn't, I'd make a fortune. And it's tough. And the Wall Street Journal that you copied, there's the Wall Street Journal, uh, Sharon copied the Wall Street Journal article, I had read it a couple days ago on the teen brain, and it talks about how there's this protracted period of adolescence now. Puberty starts earlier, it continues to drop. And it seems like it's taking longer for the young adults to get their life together. Now, obviously, part of that's the economy. If you can't get a job, is it hard to get going? The other piece to it, though, that's a really good point. If I was a, a farm kid and I'm 13 and my dad says, now you're driving the tractor, okay? Oh, and by the way, if you don't pay attention and you fall off, this thing's going to take your arm off or your leg off. Is there a good chance I'm going to be working extra hard to pay attention? Yeah. Yes, because you have real life experiences okay and real life experiences remember we talked about at the beginning 
the Stanley model and how the new students didn't have that training, those help that frontal lobe mature. So what you have to decide is, where's my kid in this, and what challenges should I let them take? What would be wise? What would be foolish? Okay. My own son, he's probably about right here. He has pretty good executive functioning. He's got good impulse control. He got his license the day after his 16th birthday. It was a Monday or Sunday. We went on Monday, got his license. A Tuesday morning, guess what he had got to do? Drive to school alone. Okay. And as he was waving goodbye, he was so sweet. He looked like a preschooler, waving, kind of nervous, right? I almost said, call me when you get there. And I didn't. And the reason I didn't was I wanted him to feel like I trusted him. And that I knew he would call if he had a problem, and I'm going to trust him. Okay? I want to have faith in him. Now, if my kid was here, would I be a fool to do that? Yeah. Yes. I'd be a fool to let him drive when he's 16. You might need to wait till 17. Some kids should wait till they're 18. They don't have the maturity. Should I have him call me? You bet. Okay? And I might even have that GPS thing on there to make sure he's at school. <laughs> right? So that he actually is safe and he's at school like the GPS thing says. Okay? Uh, some kids, the insurance companies now have those little cameras, you know, you can spy on your kid while they're driving. The thought of that abhors me from a trust perspective. I do know some kids, you should have that. It would be foolish and negligent not to have that, okay? Some of you with teenagers, you could have alcohol around your house, right? You might have a little wine or something. Some teenagers, should you have alcohol around your house? No, get rid of the alcohol. What are they gonna do? It's pretty easy to steal vodka, what do you have to do? Pour water in it, right? And a tennis can, you know, tennis ball cans? That's a great thermos, right? Water jugs, vodka looks like water, right? So you've got to think about where's your kid on this perspective. This line here, we don't have enough time to do the whole story. There's some great re research on marshmallows with preschoolers. Basically what they did is they, they told the kids they could have a marshmallow and they could eat it right away. If they could wait 10 minutes, they'd get four more. Kids on this end, if you watch the old movies of it, they can resist the marshmallow and they get four more. Kids on this end do what? Eat it right away. Kids in the middle, they wait five or six minutes, okay? When they follow those kids 20 years later, who do you think was more successful? The resistors. The kids who didn't eat the marshmallow had better education, higher incomes, higher happiness levels, sense of self, higher edu all of those things. Kids that ate it right, right away had the poorest. Okay? In terms of figuring out where your kid is, there's a variety of ways to do it. I have a simple little scale I do at St. Anne's called the Connors Rating Scale. I just give it, when we have a, a student we're concerned about, maybe they're down here. I send the rating scale out to the teachers. It's 10 questions. They fill it out. It takes them two minutes. I get six or eight of them back, score them, and I get a score. If the score is 0 to 30, if a kid's like 15, 15 to 20, they're going to be about right here. Uh, 20 to 25, they're about here. If you get a 30, you are Tigger. Um, you're, you're way down there. Okay, And you probably have all the symptoms that we've talked about if you score that high. Um, on the rating scale, what diagnosis would we be talking about on this end? ADHD. ADHD. Okay, all ADHD is, is where are you on this scale? Some kids may just have the attentional problems. In the old days, what'd you call those kids? Space cadets, right? They're spacing out. They're not impulsive, they're not hyper, they're just spacing. Other kids, quick to react, that impulsivity, they, they flip their lid all the time, the emotions come right out of them. Um, they're twirling in their seats. When I, when I do this with fourth graders, we're talking about it. One day, this little boy, Freddie, jumped up in his chair and he said, I have that! <laughs> and I'm like, yeah! <laughs> he was the same kid when my son was seven at his birthday party and the football went on the roof. Freddie stacked up the garbage cans to go get it. And my son came running in going, Dad, Freddie's on the roof! <laughs> and I'm like, what? I'm trying to make pancakes! And I run out there and there's Freddie in the cans. Could have killed himself. Right? Um, and, and he was, and he knew it, and he was there on that end of the perspective. Okay? So that would be ADHD. There's those rating scales. It shows up in testing when you have psychological testing. There's something called freedom from distractibility, which is how well can you stay focused on that. There's a brand new test out. Only a couple people in town uh, do it. One is my friend Daniela Stamatoyu. Oh, I'm, I'm phonics impaired. S T A M A T I O U. Uh, she has a machine called Quotient, and Quotient, the, it's 20 minutes, 200 bucks, cheap, 
kit sits there. Their brains, they got a little bonnet on their head to measure the elect, uh, actually it measures their eyesight. And they sit in front of a computer screen and they watch these things go by. And it measures every microsecond, where's the kid looking, okay? Now, for kids on this end, where do they look? At the little thing. For kids on that end, where do they look? Boom, 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 all over the place. I actually had a, one of my kids, I saw his results and they were off the charts. And Daniela's assistant called me and she said, he stood up during the test. I've never had a student stand up during the test, right? He couldn't even sit still for 20 minutes and look at that thing. You get a really nice graph printout. It's the only one FDA approved for diagnosis of ADHD. Yes? So if you're, are you saying that if a kid in kindergarten is really responsible, obviously has high executive function, that's going to maintain? Or are you most likely. The most likely that's going to maintain. So the majority on that scale, where you're on that scale, is largely genetic. Again, males, 50th percentile average, females, 80th percentile. For the kids that I see at my office who have ADHD, when I'm talking with them and their parents, what's the dad usually doing? Yeah. He's looking out the window or he's making patterns in my sofa. And I'm like, pay attention, man. You know, come on. You got to show your kid how to do this stuff, right? Um, if a mom has ADHD, <laughs> the chance of her offspring is about 80% that they'll have ADHD. It's huge. So when you have a mom who's pretty impulsive and hyperactive, you've got, usually got kids that are pretty impulsive and hyperactive. So majority genetic, if your kid in fifth, if kindergarten is showing pretty good executive functioning, most likely that's gonna carry on. The quickest way, if we could all have ADHD this morning when we're done, all we have to do is line up against this wall. When I say go, everybody run as fast as you can, put your head into that brick. What happens to you? You get a concussion. If your concussion, the first sign of a concussion is what? You can't pay attention, right? They, they might ask you to remember things. You can't remember, okay? It damages your frontal lobe. If it's hard enough, that damage is permanent. So you do see people with ADHD. If you go over to Craig Hospital, do they have a lot of ADHD people there now? Yes, okay? Um, so that you, you can, comes from that. Uh, lead poisoning, we'll call it, uh, cause it in preschoolers. Um, there's a few illnesses, encephalitis and meningitis can cause it during that preschool time when that frontal lobe's developing. So anything that would drastically in hinder the development of that is gonna be a problem. Uh, alcohol shuts off your frontal lobe. Do people do stupid stuff when they're drinking? Yes. Fetal alcohol syndrome is a mom who's drank and has permanently shut off that kid's frontal lobe. So the fetal alcohol syndrome, those kids have severe ADHD because that thing doesn't grow. And if you see brain slides of uh, fetuses who, and then children who died young, fetal alcohol syndrome brains are just look like a pickled brain. They're shriveled up and pickled. Uh, but it dramatically affects the development of the frontal lobe and the use of the frontal lobe. So when people are using alcohol, off the charts. Uh, medications, the medications, there, there's different ones. There's stimulants, they're non-stimulants. Basically, they're doing a couple things. They're jacking up dopamine levels, so increasing the dopamine in the frontal lobe. Uh, they also keep it, when the dopamine goes across the synapse, after it docks, it's supposed to go back. And there's another chemical that forces it back so that it's ready for the next signal, okay? So the stimulants, they're blocking what's called the reuptake of it. It keeps it over there longer. So the dopamine only, it may not have enough or it goes back too quick and the message doesn't get delivered. Uh, the old ones work three or four hours. There's newer ones that will last 13, 14 hours. And we'll talk about the care and feeding of your frontal lobe in a little bit. All right, the emotional system. Easiest way to think about your emotions is the limbic system, sort of like a donut wrapped around your automatic brain, which is down in the upper brain stem. Easiest way to think about it is a chemical factory. It's like a little factory. Story in NPR today, they were talking about uh, newer treatments for depression. Did anybody hear it? The analogy that guy used was it's like the water plant. It's the water plant. And it's spewing out all the water around the whole city, okay? Do you have a poo bear? So I'll, I'll teach you a little riddle that I talked to the kids at St. Anne's about. If we're gonna talk about happiness, like how happy are you? And can you hold on to your happiness, okay? So when I ask the kids, zero to 10, Winnie the Pooh is usually about an eight, okay? So is Winnie the Pooh pretty happy fellow? Yes, now if Winnie the Pooh went for a walk, tripped over a rock, fell down, what would he say? No. Oh, bother. <laughs> and so he would drop a little bit, but then he'd look up and he'd go, but there's honey in the tree. And he would be back to happy, and he would have a lovely walk, right? Strolling along. Piglet, the little pink guy, yeah. he's about a six, He's the worrywart. 
If Piglet chirps over the rock, what's he going to say? I, I, I better go home. I'll get hurt. There's more rocks. I, I better scurry home. And he would scurry off to home. Would he get to enjoy the rest of the walk? No, because he's back in his hut. If uh, Rabbit, you know Rabbit? <laughs> he can be happy if he's by himself in his garden, right? But let's say Rabbit goes, he's about a four. Rabbit trips over the rock. What's he feel? Mad. And he's going to pick up that rock, and that stupid rock, and throw it. And the rest of the walk, what's he going to do? Kick every possible rock he can find and kick him off the trail because he's so mad at the rocks. Okay? Uh, Eeyore. Eeyore's about a two. Eeyore is a melancholia. Eeyore trips over the rock. He says, even the rocks don't want to be my friend. And he would go along thinking about how that rock doesn't want to be his friend either. Okay? So his dips down into depression, sadness, and he can't recover. My son had a little uh, Eeyore song in preschool, and it, Eeyore sings, nobody wants to be my friend. And Pooh says, but I'm your friend. And Eeyore says, yes, but no one wants to be my friend. <laughs> then Piglet says, but I'm your friend. And Eeyore says, yes, but no one wants to be my friend. Can't let go of it, the melancholia. Now, Tigger would be a 10. If Tigger trips over the rock, what does he say? Cool, let's do it again. And he keeps doing it and doing it and doing it. He's all bruised up, having a great time, right? He's just like totally up here. The kids have told me, I guess the latest movie, he does have some sadness. His mom dies or something, Tigger's mom. I lost or something. I, I haven't seen it, but I guess he does have some other feelings. Uh, remind me to talk about Owl later on. So all your kids have their temperamental set. Some kids are not very reactive emotionally. They don't get too anxious about new things. They don't get too frustrated, okay? Um, you go to Elitch's. Everybody's all excited about going to Elitch's. But when you get there, there's that sign right by the ticket booth. And the sign says, today's ride's closed for repair. The, the non-reactive child, the Winnie the Pooh, says what? But these are well, that's open. okay. There's 25 other rides open. It's going to be great. The reactive child says what? Oh, I wanted to do that one. This is going to be terrible. This will be the worst day at Elitch's ever. Let's go home, right? And having a big fit there in the line. And you're likely to do what at that point? Fine, we're out of here. I can't take this. Or you bought the tickets already, and you're, then you're going to say, you'll enjoy yourself, young lady. <laughs> Pull it together, okay? So some kids are going to be your worriers, right? They may be afraid to get on the rights, okay? Don't want to take that risk. My son and I did some zip lining this summer, and unfortunately, a woman in front of us was a serious piglet. So before every zip line, the guy had to coach her for like 10 minutes, and she was just grouching, and she wouldn't go. And finally, she went the first time. And I'm thinking, okay, she's done it once. We're cool. The second time, every time. The guy, the instructor, young teen guy, he tried like everything, including teasing her and threatening to push her off. Then she really freaked. But every time, it was this anxiety, more anxious. So you have to think about, what's your kid? Now, yes? So are you telling us that we have to accept our children? <laughs> yes, I, I would tell all of you as we do this whole thing, the first thing is to understand your kid, who they are, and you have to have some level of acceptance of who they are. Now, does that mean you're not going to have structure for them or correct some of these things? No, you're going to have goals. We'll talk about that. But a large part, you have to accept your kids. You cannot change the roll of the dice, okay? You can modify it some. You can make it worse. The, the most important research on child development and parenting is not about where you send them to school, not about doing this, not Suzuki lessons. It's about if you neglect them and abuse them. If you can neglect and abuse your kids, they will go lower than what their roll of the dice is. You can dramatically impact a child's outcome through malnourishment, abuse, and neglect, okay? Um, those kids do not live up to their genetic potential. Now, your kids here, we can tweak them. I like to think of it as sort of like, I, I have my radio set on 90.1 FM, uh, NPR. It, it's set there almost all the time, okay? Unless my kid gets in the car and then he's switching it around, okay? Um, can I adjust the volume a little bit here and there or adjust the tuning a little bit? Yeah. So that's going to be my role with my kid is to adjust some tuning. It's not going to be a major leap. We'll talk about Princess Diaries in a minute. Um, okay, stop, how's your defense? This gets to, what's, don't flip your lid. 
So the teacher's use of that is incredible because here's the emotions down the brainstem. Your frontal lobe's supposed to stop your emotions and control them and think through it. If you flip your lid, what happens? The emotions, get it, come right out of you. I like to think of basketball. So here's that frontal lobe up here. Here's this emotional system, okay? When you're a preschooler, you're a two and three year old, do they have a lot of emotions? Yeah, so I think of it in basketball terms. Tim likes basketball. We've got four big players running down the court with the ball. How many defenders does the two-year-old have? A little small guy named Bob, okay? So Bob's back here. These four players come running down the court. Who's going to score? They are, right? They're, those emotions are going to rule. By third grade, the, kid, the emotional systems will dampen down as they get into kindergarten, first grade. The kids even have sayings for it. You get what you get and you don't pitch a fit. Um, if a kid is too emotional, they say you're being a cry baby, okay? Kids understand you're supposed to have more emotional control. Now we've got two players come down the court with the ball. You're hoping you've got two reasonably sized players from the frontal lobe to stop them. So the frontal lobe's gonna say stop. And then it's gonna say to a very specific part of your frontal lobe, it's on the right hemisphere, and it says, let's think about my feelings. Do I need to be mad? How mad should I be? When should I express my anger? How should I express my anger? If I express it this way, what will happen? If I express it this way, what will happen? Is that a thoughtful person? Yes, right? So now third or fourth grade, we're hoping it's two on two. Adolescence, there's a doubling of emotion for teenagers. So the emotional centers of teenagers are twice as active as children and adults. There's four big players coming down the court. We have half the dopamine levels, twice as many brain cells. It works about in half. We got one player back. So we got a medium-sized guy and four big players coming out with the ball. Who's gonna win? Chances are these guys are gonna score. By 26, 28, you're hoping a little less emotion. They're still pretty emotional at that age. We're hoping it's three on three, okay? Every generation of your life, what do you hope happening every decade? A little less emotion and more wisdom, right? Do you read about much impulsive behavior with 70 year olds? No, okay, my mom's 85. I don't think she's getting liquored up tonight. Um, or she's gonna go out and have, the, the old guy's gonna have a panty raid at the retirement community. It, it's really much more wisdom, less emotion. You're hoping, sorry, just, just think of the fraternity house. You know, fraternity house guys, what are they? Like all emotion, reward, joy, the reward system. The Wall Street Journal talks about the reward system for teenagers. They really perceive this giant reward. The other thing, to, we're going to turn the teen hormones. The other thing to keep in mind, though, more and more researchers are looking at the teen brain as, a, as sort of a discrete brain unto itself. It's not an underdeveloped adult brain. It has a very specific purpose. And if you think about thousands of years ago, what was the purpose of the teen brain? What's the main things it had to do? Find a mate, procreation, defend your species, feed yourself, create a hut, right? You had to survive. So that survival for guys meant impulsivity, right? You gotta go out and hunt, you gotta fight, you gotta defend. You gotta seek out and find a mate, okay? So that brain is designed for those kind of things, risk-taking behaviors. So you see the teenagers doing these risky things because in their mind, they do understand risk. Teenagers understand risk, but what are they more excited about? Reward. The reward or being the cool guy. The ladies will love this. I'll be <coughs> Mr. Big Guy, right? Those three 14-year-olds at Vail last weekend, they were looking at that closed slope. You're hoping one of them said, maybe, maybe it's closed for a reason, right? We could get hurt if we go down that slope. But what took over? The emotions, what are they thinking? Powder, this is gonna be incredible, right? Did they expect to trigger an avalanche? No, one of those 14 year olds is dead now. That overruled. Now we're gonna look at the emotions. It's on your next page of your handout. Oh, wrong way. This is a quick, simple explanation of the female hormone system. Again, very simplified. If you wanna read a great book, read The Female Brain. And then her second one's called the male brain. 
Now, contrary to popular belief, the male brain is just as long as the female brain in the book. <laughs> Most guys would think, yeah, the male brain's probably two pages. Um, but it's just as long, and there are quite a few hormones that affect men. Two main ones for women. During the first two weeks of the cycle, estrogen levels are really high. Estrogen does a whole lot of stuff. Speeds up cognition. So women are sharper during the first two weeks. They're a little zippier with their cognitive processing. They pay better attention, okay? Uh, more focused, less sports injuries. They're, they're performing at a higher level. Um, it's, it's sort of that, and the verbalness, the social cueing. So my graduate student is a, a wonderful artist, Liz. She, she put this picture together, he calls her super gal. And peak performance is around day 12 of the cycle. So if you want to take your SATs, your high school girls, do it on day 12, okay? Taps out at day 14 with ovulation. Once that happens, estrogen levels drop and progesterone shoots up. When progesterone shoots up, she, she drew it as like a weed killer. Stress and sensitivity go up. Uh, I just read a couple days ago, uh, females during the second half of their cycle, when progesterone raises up, have a more acute sense of pain. They feel pain more than when estrogen levels are high. So estrogen does some pain dampening. So now stress and sensitivity are up, and during the final week, it all sort of collapse, and more of that anger and hostility. Now my wife, who works a lot with teen girls and our, our staff, our therapist, I did bring some materials from my practice, by the way, they're over on that table if you're interested. We are doing some sports performance stuff and have another uh, parent talk coming up in March. Um, she always tells the teenage girls, if it's in the second half of your cycle, wait two days to make a decision. If you're gonna break up with your boyfriend, drop a class, pick your college, don't do it impulse. Give it two days to think about it. If you do it on impulse, what's gonna happen? Might make the bad choice, okay? I tell dads, with these Lutheran dads the other, the other day, I said, okay guys, if you're gonna have one of those talks that start with, honey, I need to talk to you about something, when should you do it? During the first two weeks. You're probably gonna have a nice conversation. My brother, for years, took each of his daughters every week out to dinner, you know, little nice conversation. They'd go out to daughter, dinner with each daughter, great ritual they had. If it does it during the first two weeks, good conversation. Does it during the fourth week and the dad's emotional and he responds, what's gonna happen? It is not gonna be good. It, it's gonna get pretty ratcheted up. So that's a simple look at the female system for males. Um, there are four major uh, hormones involved for males. I'm just talking about testosterone today. That's one of the big players. You'll see during fetal development, testosterone levels are really high. They drop down um, after birth. So here's the conception, birth, they drop down. Here's the latency age period for boys. Between nine and 15, there's a 20-fold increase in testosterone, okay? Testosterone has to do with some aggression issues, has to do with territoriality, right? I own this spot, push me off. King of the Hill, remember that for you guys? Remember King of the Hill? You stand on the hill and the other guys try to push you off, right? You're the king, okay? Uh, and sex drive, okay? When I was in sixth grade, this kid came up to me and he said, did you know scientists found that the average sixth grade boy has an erection every 10 seconds? And I remember thinking, yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's pretty much true. Mm -hmm. I got that, okay? It is an amazing drive, okay? It is really intense. So for those of you with males, for boys, is there a good chance that pornography is going to enter your household during the middle school years? Yes. And if you don't think it is, you've got your head in the sand. Pretty much every guy hears about, you can Google this. Ours was, my son's friend told me, you could Google Britney's boobs and you could see Britney Spears. Well, my son found Britney Spears boobs, but then guess what else got served to him? Lots of other stuff, not very attractive, okay? We had a, a little talk about it, thought it worked. A couple months later, I turn my computer on, a little naked woman pops up on my screen going, would you like to come to my site? And I'm like, Alex, what is this doing on this computer, right? I had him read an article out of the Denver Post about pornography and attitudes towards women um, and anger and rage towards women, violence towards women, and how these women are prisoners, basically. He had to read it, he had a line on it. I was for sure he was an insightful, self-directed young man, <laughs> proud of to be a St. Anne student who could control his impulses. A couple months later, guess what? It was back. I put a password on the computer, okay? 
It stayed on for about a year. I hated it because I had to type in the password every time. Absolutely hated it. And in seventh grade, I'm like, honey, can we take the password off? He looked at me and he said, no. <laughs> I'm like, okay, thank you. And we left it on for another year. Now, what I was pleased on that one, he knew. He was insightful that he knew he would go looking at that stuff. Okay? Then in eighth grade, I got, got him his first laptop for high school, and he said, do whatever you want. And, and if you get a virus and it breaks your, your hard drive, you're paying for it. I don't care. Just stay off my computer. Do not use mine. Are you saying this stuff is <laughs> the testosterone or the porn? <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, it's everywhere. Now, um, the other piece I had uh, uh, at Denver Academy was to talk about the frontal lobe, just on the frontal lobe, and this coach, we did mention this in this coach, tennis coach at Mullen, varsity tennis coach. He said, you can't believe how much struggle I have with my varsity players. Because every time when they're returning a serve or they're serving, what do they want to do? Just kill it. And he said, the average tennis, what do you, what do you call it, volley, should be 10 seconds. For the high school guy, it's about four seconds. Th because they want to kill it. That impulse is just hammer it. Instead of volleying, setting up a shot, being more strategic. And he said that's his hardest part of his job, getting them to control those impulses. It does decrease over time, right? And now you see the commercials with a guy who's like, you know, my age, and he's like low T, right? And then he <laughs> goes to his doctor, gets the injection, and he's playing golf. Looking at the wife. Now, in the commercial, the wife's like, yeah, probably in real life, she's going, ah, oh, get away from me. I'm, I'm leaving. I'm going away. Um, so you, you can treat that. The one thing uh, for adult males, the, the one thing you should stay away, the, not stay away from, I enjoy it myself, alcohol decreases testosterone levels, right? So the quickest way, if you want to decrease your testosterone, drink a lot. Okay, that, that will do it. Um, so that's the emotional systems. Again, that teenager, things are really cranking up. Things become very emotional. Now, I want to get to the third component of the brain. Oh, wrong way. The nonverbal processing center, and what we're going to call is your corpus callosum. Okay, so real quickly, I'm going to ask the question, how did you pick your seat today? How, why did you sit where you sat? My friend, friend. Your friend was there. Perfect. What else? I why else? Sit here. You always sit there, and you're the director, so does that make sense? No. Your, routine. A routine, and it, it would be good for you to be there because you hosted it, right? Okay. Why else? It was empty. It was empty. Available seat. Okay. Um, maybe you needed to hear, see. Now, you, don't, you can just wink at me. Did any of you sit where you sat because you, didn't wanna, you saw somebody you didn't want to sit by? Okay. Not here at Stanley. Not here at Stanley, of course not. But do sometimes we avoid people. Right? Okay? Lots of different reasons. Now imagine we're a middle schooler. We're walking into the middle school classroom. Um, teacher says, David. David's one of my neighbors, um, who's just the greatest guy. And his wife, Susanna. Do you know David? And what's he yeah. teach? Eighth grade English? Yeah, eighth grade English. He was a phenomenal teacher. And his wife, Susanna, is delightful. They got a couple kids. I see him walking by every day with this giant stroller. It's like, whoa, they got a lot of kids. So David says, okay, everybody have a seat. What's the middle school kid have to think about when they're sitting down? Friends, obviously. Do they have to think about enemies? Right? If they're trying to study and do well, do they want to sit next to a tigger? No. Okay? Um, now, let's say the two, these two are always sitting together on the couch. They have couches. Um, they're two always together. I come in. Uh, she's not here yet. She was uh, delayed getting her books or something. The seat on the couch is open next to you. Should I notice and think about that before I sit down? Yeah. If I sit down, what is she probably going to do? <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> and then I might get the loser, right? I made the wrong choice. If I sit down with a kid who's been bullying me, what's probably going to happen? I'm going to get bullied, right? So there's all these possible reasons to do what we do in every fraction of a second. Easiest way to think about it, I've got little discrete pieces of stained glass you know, glass, colored glass. Those are like discrete facts. Your brain has, over on this side, the right hemisphere, has these things called spindle and mirror neurons. The mirror and spindle neurons have arms, axioms, that are up to three feet long in our brain. They wind all through the brain, all over the place. And they collect 
the little bits of information. And they take it across the middle. This is called the corpus callosum that connects your two hemispheres. Looks like a tube between the two hemispheres. Connects it and puts it together in a perfect picture of where you should sit. If you make the right choice, you're considered a social butterfly, right? If you make the wrong choice and I sit in that seat, then you would say I'm a little more socially awkward, okay? Does that make sense? So it's collecting that stuff, painting that picture of how I should act. Now, if we did a test, there are tests, and I included one, the eye test, which I don't know if I'll have time to do it today. Where do you suppose the average female is when you do the test? About 80th percentile, okay? Women's corpus callosums are about twice the size of men. They're also a lot faster. They're powered by estrogen. The more estrogen you have, the faster that all goes, okay? So if the moms were planning the middle school dance, how many meetings will they have? 30. And it's going to be an amazing dance. They're going to think about every child in the class, what their food needs are, so they'll have gluten-free snacks, they'll have the organics, they'll have the vegan snacks. Everything will be taken care of, right? It's going to be absolutely perfect. They're going to think about all the needs of the kids. If the dads plan it, how many meetings are they going to have? One. And they're going to be like, uh, you got a Costco membership, right, Bob? You know, get those uh, juice drinks and Rice Krispie treats. And you've got crate paper, right? You know, we'll stream that. We're done, okay? <laughs> Average guys about here, our corpus callosums are smaller. <laughs> and what's that? Why do you need the crate paper? Why do we need crate paper? <laughs> yeah, don't worry about it. We'll bag it. Corpus callosum is smaller and it's slower. Um, Jeff Foxworthy said when it comes to social processing, women are uh, eight lane superhighways and men are two lane country roads. And it's pretty much true. Women also process emotions higher in the brain, so they tend to cross over the corpus callosum and they get put into the picture. Men process emotions lower in the brain and a lot of them don't rise up to cross over. So a lot of times when you look at your husband and you say, how do you feel about that? And he says, fine. He probably does, right? And he's not just repressing his emotions. Now, he might have a kernel of it. There might be a kernel down in there. And if you're good enough with your tweezers, you can pull it out. But generally, there's not as much consciousness about emotions. Make sense? So average guy is about 50th percentile. Average engineering guy is going to be about here. Okay? The Bill Gates of the world are going to be about here. Okay? So when you read about Bill Gates, he sounds very socially awkward. He also has high levels of anxiety. He gets new situations, make him very anxious, uh, and doesn't really have the social cueing. His wife apparently is a social butterfly. Great movie to watch with your kids is the Princess Diary movie. The girl Mia, she starts out down here. With the help of Julie Andrews, her grandmother, who's magic, she ends up here, okay? Now that's Hollywood. Can you really go that far with a kid? Probably not, okay? But she transforms her into this elegant, socially sophisticated person. Now, the difference between Mia and the movie and Mean Girls, Mean Girls have great social processing. So right now, bully me with your eyes. Give me a bullying look. That's good, right? I've gotten some in audiences where I'm like, oh my God, that was terrifying. Um, mean girls are great at it, and what do they use it for? Power and control. They want power and control. Nice girls use it to help connect, to help people feel good about each other and enjoy the dance all together. They're not looking to be popular. Does that make sense? So that's our social processing piece. Now, as we put, put those all together, you're thinking about your kid, there's this interplay of all those three systems, okay? So if we wanted to create, uh, in, in the article, the introvert. Introverts tend to like to be more by themselves. They usually have deep powers of focus where they can concentrate, write, etc. Bill Gates would work on computer programming for hours and hours and hours, okay? Does he probably have good frontal lobe functioning? Yeah, high frontal lobe functioning. He's also very anxious. He has a very reactive anxiety system, okay? I, I guess at a Bono concert, U2 concert, he was there in the front row, and he left because he was so paranoid about the fans. He thought the fans were going to rush and crush Bono. He was just betwixt with anxiety. High level anxiety, low level social processing, okay? So he's not reading the nonverbal Situ nonverbal situations with their kids. He, he didn't hang out with the other kids in middle school. He hung out with teachers. His anxiety is higher. But you put him alone in a room, can he really do great stuff? Yes. If you want to create Bill Clinton, 
<laughs> Bill Clinton is known as the most extroverted president we've ever had. Bill, is Bill Clinton sort of impulsive? Uh, yes, okay. Not as good executive functioning. Does he get real anxious about things? Not too much. He's a risk taker, okay. Does he have amazing nonverbal skills? Yes. High nonverbal, not much anxiety, poor impulse control. That's how you get an extrovert, an extreme extrovert. Okay, they're risk takers. They, they, they're in the article, Wall Street guys, right? The ones that caused the crash. And on the other side is Warren Buffett. If, if a venture capitalist was interested in a new thing, he's gonna be all fired up, let's take the risk. Warren Buffett's gonna do what? Let me think about it for a couple days. And he's gonna crunch all the numbers in his room, in his office, at his home that he grew up in. And he's gonna come out, he's a, an introvert. So that's that interplay. The teen brain, you really get it going. You got half the frontal lobe functioning, you got more emotion. The social processing for the teenager, I forgot to mention, really increases. For girls, it starts in about fourth grade. Third, end of third grade, start of fourth grade, the girls really start to do in the looks and who we're friends with and all these sort of things, right? Why don't you join our group? Um, that continues on. For boys, it's usually about fifth grade, sixth grade. They start doing more of this social identification, really cranking up. Middle school, I like to, to say that uh, learning social skills in middle school, it's like teaching people to juggle for the first time and you give them steak knives. If you start juggling with steak knives, what's gonna happen? You're gonna get cut and the kids around you are gonna get cut. Positive way to look at junior high uh, social development is they're learning to become tomorrow's leaders and politicians. That's the exciting part of it, but it's pretty ugly and messy, okay? So during those teen times, you get a lot of what's called angst. Uh, Soren Kierkegaard came up with that term, teen angst. What you're hoping in academics, in music, sports, arts, Every way, you're directing your kids, keeping them busy. Do teenagers do well, well with lots of idle time? Not too well, especially the impulsive ones, okay? So you're, you're directing them, and the saying is, out of chaos comes a shooting star, right? One quick tip, and I'm gonna get to our final slide. Speed and spontaneity are the enemies for your teenager. They are fast enough already, they're spontaneous enough already. When we talk about technology next week, when they call you up in the middle of something to ask for something, all you're encouraging is faster behavior. You're just getting them all sped up. You don't want your teenagers to be sped up. In Romeo and Juliet, what's the only thing Romeo had to do to change the outcome of that play? Wait. If he had just sat, called his buddy T and said, hey man, I'm kind of bummed, Juliet's dead. Would you come talk to me? Juliet would have woken up, right? But he acted on impulse and emotion kills himself, she dies, okay? Are there real life Romeo and Juliet's with our kids? Yes. So, slow them down, speed and spontaneity of the enemy. We've already talked about this, know your child and give them the structure they need. Some kids really need to be in seats and, f and, and lots of rules for how they're gonna function. Before you get in the car, you're gonna go over every possible rule. Where you're sitting, how you're not gonna touch your sister, how you're not gonna step on the seatbelt in front of you, and what the consequences will be if you do that, okay? So you're gonna give them a, a fence. I had one little boy say to me, Mr. Nimberg, I don't need a fence, I need a brick wall. And I'm like, you're right, you do. And we're going to Waterworld today, so how are we gonna build you a brick wall? How are we gonna make sure you're safe? Going over lots of rules. Rules should always be clear rules and clear consequences. Your kids need to know what are the rules, what are the consequences gonna be. For the more internally directed kid, can you let them pick some of the consequences more? Yes, and they'll talk to you about it. You can have great discussions and build insight. We'll talk about that. For some kids, you're just saying, here's the law. Here's what it's gonna be. Freshman year, sophomore year, junior year, senior year. Here's your curfew, period. If you miss your curfew, you're grounded for a week. If you fuss, you're grounded for two weeks, okay? Some kids need that. You've got to decide what your kid needs. This half double rule, I love this. Part of discipline is to start behavior or stop behavior. The other part of discipline is to build insight. You're helping children learn to be insightful and in how their, their actions make others feel. What comes back to them in life is by how they behave. One way to promote insight is use the half double rule. So if your kid makes a mistake and they get grounded, my son used to lose his Disney uh, channel. Um, Lizzie McGuire was the show. And I'd say, okay, you lost Lizzie McGuire for one night. Now, if he talked to me about it, he took responsibility, he showed insight about why he acted the way he did, he got the last 15 minutes back. If he didn't, he lost it for two nights, okay? 
So you want to use the half double rule as a way to build insight into why we act the way we do. Um, for some kids with teenagers, they get pretty emotional. You might have them write it. You can always have them write it for you if it's too hard to talk to you about. Social goals, all kids should have social and emotional goals. My son's big one, he's half Italian. When he gets upset, he doesn't want to talk. And I've said to him, you know, if you're going to drive the car, I need to see more expression. You need to be able to talk about things man to man and not just go silent because I don't need a silent guy who's getting in the car and driving. Is that a recipe for danger? Yes. Okay, I don't need to upset teenager driving. So his is going to be related to that. Some of your kids need some social goals. Might be to take a risk, invite some kids over, join a club, right? There's research on teenagers. Teenagers that have two or three extracurricular activities involved in structured programs, youth groups, et cetera, sports, are more resilient. They do better, okay? You might have your kid getting a little more involved. You might have the super social child, and what's your, the goal for them? Not so much socializing. Right? We need to turn off that phone. We need to stop getting on that internet. We need to stop talking to the friends. We need to focus on academics. Right? That kid might be a little bit less. I had a little boy the other day said to me, my goal this year is to not be so stubborn. I was like, that's a good one for you. He's an angry guy. He gets really angry and really stubborn. Right? He's going to work on not being stubborn. Positive messages. Your kid needs lots of positives. They need to hear good things from you about what they're doing, how they're succeeding in their goals, just the fact that they exist on the planet. I like the 1 to 10 ratio. For every negative your kid gets, they need 10 positives. Okay? Now, for exceptional kids, so kids who are like Tigger on that end of the spectrum, statistically they get 10 times the negative feedback as other kids. They need a lot of positives. When they come home, they are beat. A lot of those kids drop out of school. They have higher rates of depression, higher rates of suicide. They get a lot of negatives. They need a lot of positives. Okay? Um, there are some kids who might be a little too much full of these positives and just think they're so special, right? <laughs> what do all first graders have to learn? You're really not that special, and so is everybody else. Or you are special, but so is everyone else. Right. Everybody's special. That doesn't mean you always get to go first, right? <laughs> and other people get to go first. And that's a real heartbreak for some of the kids, right? Um, so positive messages, connecting emotionally, Rituals are things you do every day in your family. Is good night routine, is that a great ritual? Yes. When you drop your kids off, any of you have a ritual when you drop your kid off, something you say or do? Anybody? Usually you say something really special. Kids like rituals, we all do better. We do the same thing over and over and over again. Could be daily, could be weekly. When I was a kid, we'll, just, we'll end in about two minutes. If you need to leave, that's fine. When I was a kid, every Sunday night we watched Bonanza, had grilled cheese and tomato soup, and then played cards afterwards. Every Sunday night for my childhood. It was incredible. That was our regular Sunday ritual. Kids need those, and especially the ones that are making them feel close. Right? I had a mom tell me about butterfly kisses, where you do your eyelashes. So every morning when she'd drop her off, she would do a butterfly kiss with her daughter. Okay? Um, also, like when your kid's upset and having a tough time, the idea of sort of fly fishing for emotions. So if you, you're, you're sort of like putting it out there. So if you say to a kid, how was your day? What's the F word coming your way? Fine. It was fine. Anything happen? No. So you really got to be a little more sneaky about it. They get in the car, you talk about something they love, how you just saw horses on the way over, or um, you know the avalanche game last night, or the nuggets, and then you might kind of go, oh, um, do you have all your assignments before you leave campus? Because if you don't do that for some kids, you're coming back, right? Got all your books, okay, great, we're driving home. Oh, I, I, I heard uh, there was a birthday party over the weekend. Sue had a birthday party. Oh, okay. Right. Oh, and, oh, yeah, you, you knew that she didn't invite everybody. Yeah, I, I don't know. What do you think about that? That's, that's not so great, is it? You see, I'm just sort of taking a little information that I collect from other parents or the teacher. Spelling test, science test, how are we doing? I just throw it out there. Get the kids talking, opening up their emotional soul. Adventures, I have a website and blog dedicated for, it's not families as well, it's called Adventure Dad, but we have mom stuff on there, we have family stuff. Getting outside with your kids, doing adventures, getting them involved in the outdoors. Do kids need more oxygen and exercise? Yes. So doing adventures with your kids, you're welcome to go to the website, I have a flyer on that. Karen, feeding your frontal lobe, first thing is always talk to the kids, protect your president, wear a helmet, you've got to wear a helmet. The big four for increasing dopamine levels and increasing your executive functioning. Lots of water during the day. Kids should be drinking water all day. 
Uh, do you, you get a headache up here? The main cause is dehydration. So you want lots of water. Um, sleep. Do your kids need 10 or 11 hours of sleep? Yes. So does my 18 year old. He does not get it. He's lucky if he gets six or seven. The amount of homework is just amazing. Sleep, water, and I can always tell when he hasn't had enough because he is grouchy. Um, nutrition. Okay. Good nutrition. Do donuts really fire up your frontal lobe? No. Okay. You burn them off quick. They are gone. Kids need protein or whole grain oatmeal. Those are the two best things you can feed them in the morning. They should have lots of protein snacks during the day. That's going to fire up their frontal lobe and it's going to keep it going the longest, most consistently. Okay. The donut's going to fire it up and that's what's going to happen. It's going to drop. Okay. Um, caffeine, coffee. I saw the sign in the coffee bar said it's for adults only. <laughs> caffeine bumps up our dopamine levels about four times. Two hours later, what happens? Crashes. Okay. Um, so we don't want to be doing it with that. We want good nutrition, protein going up. The fourth one is exercise. Lots of exercise. Exercise bumps up your dopamine levels four times, and it stays. It stays for a nice long time, and it tapers off. You don't have the radical crashes. If you want to turbocharge your kid's brain, get them to hyper-focus, there's two things you can have them do. Play video games. Video games will spike their do dopamine levels 16 times. Okay? When they're on those video games, are they thinking about anything else? No. no. You can't get them off. When they do stop doing it, their dopamine levels crash out of the act. Crabby and grouchy. Okay? For about four hours after they've done it, their brain's chemistry is committed to memory. It's just trying to memorize what it was doing during that time. It is not committed to novel learning. So after you've played video games for an hour or so, then you try to do your algebra, what's going to happen? It's not going to happen. You, you, you can't learn new things after playing video games. The other thing you can do is let them smoke pot. Pot will increase your dopamine levels about 16 times. When pot wears off, how do people act? Crabby, grouchy, pissed, right? Uh, they get hyper-focused. You, you, you bump up your dopamine level that much, and you're going to be going, wow, his coat's black, but it's got an orange thing on the zipper. Why did they do that? Whoa, that's intense. Right? I'm stoned. I've got so much dopamine, I'm totally hyper-focused. Yes? Can you reset that, like, after the video games, for instance, by, you know, quick burst of exercise or something? It, I don't know that for sure. I don't know that for sure. The latest stuff I was reading about that memory, the chemicals that go to memory versus creative learning, same chemicals, it's about four hours. I don't know whether or not exercise would change that. that that's a really good question. There are some long-term research just came out of China that showed less frontal lobe development for kids who are addicted to the gaming systems. Now, th these were kids who were addicted over years and were playing 10, 12 hours a day. Hopefully none of your kids are doing that. But, but it did show less developed frontal lobes in the teenagers. So there are some longer term brain deficits. Um, just zipping through, emotional sharing time. Problem solving, biting your tongue. I wish I could invent a meter to tell you when to let your kid do it versus biting your tongue. I would tell you for most of your kids, I, I believe in parenting, to, I'm gonna give them as much rope as my son can have without hanging himself. But I would prefer autonomy and independence. I have never checked my son's power school at Arapaho. Never looked at it. I've never seen his report card in four years. I haven't seen his homework since about fourth grade. He's got straight A's, right? He's applying to the presidential program at CU. I haven't had to, okay? And I don't want to. Now, if I had a different kid, should I be checking power school? Yes, okay? I should be checking what the grades are, making sure we got the assignments in. I'm gonna have to have more structure, more rules. So again, it's part of your kid. Give him as much as you can. Don't get too wrapped up in their emotional stuff. That's a huge one. The one research study on a gossip, girls who gossip in middle school, the main correlation they found, their mothers did what? Gossiped. That was number one correlation. If you want to have a girl, middle school girl that gossips a lot, gossip yourself, and you will create a gossipy girl. Okay? So you've got to make sure you're not doing that stuff, not getting too emotionally wound up into it all. Uh, care feeding your frontal lobe, limit electronics. ASD is autism spectrum disorder. For kids who are on that lower end of social processing, they need help taking risks because they don't understand it. It's confusing for them. It's anxiety producing. Learning to ask for help. Sometimes they need to ask for help because they don't understand it. And learning how to fake it. Now, this is good for all guys. I was talking to the seventh grade boys yesterday about, we were talking about bullying and sexual harassment and how some of the guys are going to tell gay jokes and, you know, you, you not laugh or tell them 
you know, knock it off, that's not funny. If you're ever in a situation where it's a big group of guys and you don't feel like you can stand up to tell them that's not funny, you might just kind of go, ha ha, laugh just a touch and don't laugh anymore and don't tell any of yourself. If you don't laugh at all, what could come your way? Eight guys picking on you, right? And so you might have to just fake a little bit. I always tell the kids in the, the ASD, autism range, Asperger's syndrome, I'll say, look, the kids are gonna be telling sex jokes and you may not know what a condom is. Well, if you're the only kid not laughing, what's gonna happen? Oh, they're turning, you don't know what a condom is. Oh, T doesn't know, right? Now, if you laugh too much, what are they gonna say? Oh, what, you got a joke? And then you found out. So I just teach them, you laugh a little and just kind of fake it. They need help with the social piece. Don't, it doesn't come naturally. Uh, structured social interactions, you can read that at your leisure. These are for the younger children, just kind of helping them through a play date. One of the best things I always thought, kids always remember the last thing on any interaction. They remember the last five minutes. So you always try to end your play dates on a positive note, okay? Because when they go home and the mom says, how was your play date? If the last five minutes are crummy and the first hour and a half were great, they're gonna say, it was terrible, right? <laughs> if the last five minutes are great, first hour and a half were heck, five, last five minutes are great, they're like, I wanna go back to his house, it's great, okay? So social interactions. Finally, we do run groups in my office, that's one of the brochures, and we work with kids with all those different issues to improve social processing, emotional control, self-control. The main issue I think about when all kids are going to struggle at some time, if your kid's struggles are chronic in nature, then that's probably a good time to get them help. If they're really struggling, it's a chronic in nature. And they're complaining about it. When they're saying, I wish I could be more social. I wish I got invited to birthday parties and I don't. That's a good time to, to seek out that. Thank you very much. You've been a very patient audience. Thank you. Um, and again, there's some handouts over there. I can